I'm going to improvise like a writer on some assumptions. And though I, I feel a little uneasy in doing this and saying this, nevertheless, what a writer is obliged at some point to realize is that he's involved in a language which he has to change. For example, for a black writer, especially in this country, to be born into the English language is to realize that the assumptions of the language, the assumptions on which the language operates, are his enemy. <laughs> when Othello kills Desdemona, for example, he says, I threw away a pearl richer than all my tribe. I was very young when I read that, and I wondered about that. Richer than my tribe? <laughs> I really had to think about being as black as sin, as black as night, black-hearted, and in order, this is another story which I won't go into, in order to, to deal with that, really, to deal with that, at a certain time in my life, when I was not in this country, but in France, where I could not speak to anybody because I spoke no French, but no one wanted to speak to me, <laughs> I dropped into a silence in which I heard, for the first time, really heard and began to be able to try to deal with the beat of the language of the people who had produced me. I might have been able to do that here, but in the, in the event I was not able to do it here. I did it far away. And when I was able to hear that music, because when I was young, there were no black writers as models, and white writers could not be models either. I did not agree at all with the moral predicament of Huckleberry Finn concerning Nigger Jim. It was not, after all, a question about whether I should be sold back into slavery. <laughs> I want to try to shift a certain assumption. I want to suggest that instead of, as we have now for far too long, according to me, Instead of speaking about the civil rights movement, which is an American phrase, which I'm going to go into in a moment, which upon examination means nothing at all, let us pretend that I stand before you as a witness and let us pretend that everyone under the sound of my voice is in the same condition. I'm a witness to and a survivor of the latest slave rebellion. I put it that way because Malcolm X and I met many years ago when Malcolm was doing a debate with a very young sit-in student and Malcolm was a black Muslim, and the radio station called me to moderate this discussion, which I did. I was not needed, I must tell you. Malcolm was one of the most beautiful and one of the most gentle men I met in all my life. He asked the boy a question, which I now present to you. If you are a citizen, why do you have to fight for your civil rights? If you're fighting for your civil rights, that means you're not a citizen. And in fact, the legality of this country, and I won't further investigate the word legality, has never had anything to do with its former slaves. 
We are still governed by the slave codes. Now, when I say a slave rebellion, I mean that what is called the civil rights movement was really insurrection. It was co-opted. Now the late J. Edgar Hoover is in his grave, God bless him. A lot of what I knew and many other people knew during those years. And only a fraction of what we knew during all those years can now be more or less discussed. So one can say that the latest slave rebellion was brutally put down. We all know what happened to Medgar. And it was not some lunatic who happened to be wandering around Mississippi with a gun. The one lunatic in Mississippi at that moment <laughs> happened to have a gun somewhere. And by some odd coincidence, unbelievable, shot Medgar Evers in the carport of his home in the sight and hearing of his wife and his children. And Medgar was 37. The lunatic was carried into the front door visibly of a nursing home and out the back door, and that was that. We all know what happened to Malcolm. We all know what happened to Martin. We know what happened to Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. And so many more. Honey, don't tell me. <laughs> I mean, the list is long. That is the result of a slave rebellion. Now, I'm saying that since we are the survivors of it, since we have our children to raise, to save, I'm saying that to say a very brutal thing must be said. It must be said. The intentions of this melancholy country as concerns black people. And anyone who doubts me can ask any Indian. I've always been genocidal. They needed us for labor and for sport. Now, they can't get rid of us. We cannot be exiled. And we cannot be accommodated. Now something's got to give. The machinery of this country operates day in and day out, hour by hour, until this hour, to keep the nigger in his place. When I was young, among other things, I used to run an elevator, murderously, but I ran it. I am not needed to run the elevator no more. Mm? A whole lot of things we used to do, we ain't needed for no more. On the other hand, we're here. It is true that this is going to be a difficult summer. In every city in this nation now, black father is standing in the street watching black son. They're watching each other. And they neither one of them got no place to go. That is not their fault. It's nothing to do with their value, their merit, their capabilities. There may be nothing worse under heaven there may be no greater crime than to attack a man's integrity, 
to attempt to destroy that man. For I know, in spite of the American Constitution, in spite of all the born-again Christians, I know that my father was not a mule and not a thing. And that my sister was not born to be the plaything of idle white sheriffs. What am I saying? I'm saying we find ourselves between a rock, if you like, and a hard place. I am saying something else. I am saying that our presence in this country <laughs> terrifies every white man walking. I'm going to go back and clarify that in a minute. I want to suggest, and it's a very important suggestion, first of all, this is not now, never has been, and now never will be a white country. There is not a white person in this country, from our president to all his friends, who can prove he's white. It is absolutely true. The people who settled this country came from many places. And where they were before they came here was France, England. In France, they were French. In England, they were English. In Italy, they were Italian. In Greece, they were Greek. In Russia, they were Russian. It is worth noting, by the way, that this um, uh, phenomenon, phenomenon called Europe has never agreed about anything at all except us. They don't get along until this hour. The only thing that ever unites them, the common market, for example, is about us. And they can't get that together. So they're squabbling over what's left of their colonies. In short, they lost their clowns, Ray Charles might put it. And this means that we have to consider, first of all, that white, Malcolm said, it's a state of mind. I don't want to be mis misunderstood as saying, I'm not talking about white people. Insofar as you think you're white, you're irrelevant. We can no longer afford that particular romance. We are all, in any case, here. I want to point out a paradox. The only people in this country who have any notion of who they are, the only people in this country who have any notion of who they are, are the black people in this country. And I will tell you why. When the Italian got here, or the Greek, or whoever, there was a moment in his life when he had to start to speak English, when he became a guy named Joe. And that meant he couldn't speak to his father because his father couldn't speak English. That meant a rupture a profound rupture. So the son did become a guy named Joe and never found out anything else about himself. We come out of a history, black people in this country kind of come out of a history which was never written down. The connection between father and son, between mother and daughter, until this hour and in spite of the danger in which we stand and all that I know is happening all around us every day, we forged ourselves out of this fire. And if we could do that, and we have done that, we can deal with what now lies before us. I know I ain't got no jobs to give nobody. I know that. I know I ain't got no money. I can't co-opt you. <laughs> I know many things must be done, and I know that I can't do them. But I also know that I've got to do them alone. 
We have never been alone. That's a mystery. Every white person in this country, I do not care what he says or she says, knows one thing. They may not know, as they put it, what I want. But they know they would not like to be black here. If they know that, they know everything they need to know. And whatever else they say is a lie. Bear it in mind, children, I mean that. The American idea of progress, when the Americans talk about progress, they mean how fast I become white. <laughs> and it's a trick bag. Because I know perfectly well I can never become white. I've drunk my share of dry martinis. I have proven myself civilized in every way I can. But there is an irreducible difficulty. <laughs> Something doesn't work. Well, I decided, I decided, I might as well act like a nigga. Now, the black people of this country stand in a very strange place. So do the white people of this country stand in a very strange place. And almost for the very same reason, that we approach it from different points of view. I pretend, I suggest, you think about it, that what um, the CIA, for example, I use the word advisedly, for example, or the President of the United States, for example, all ambassadors except one, don't know about the world which surrounds them is the price they pay for not knowing me. If you couldn't deal with my father, how are you going to deal with the people in the streets of Tehran? I could have told you if anyone had asked. And the fall of the Shah did not in the least astonish me, nor did it make me sad. But this means that the black people of this nation represent for the Western powers. And for the Western powers, for the moment, bearing in mind what we must do to save our children, for the moment, let us substitute the word conspiracy. There is a reason. There is a reason that no one wants our children until this day educated. When we attempt ourselves to do it, we find ourselves up against the vast machinery of the system of education in this country, which is, among other things, a billion-dollar industry. And the billion-dollar industry is more important than the life of the child. Now, I want to suggest, and I want everyone to think about it, I know the machinery is vast, ruthless, cunning, and thinks of nothing, in fact, but itself, which means us, because we are a threat to the machinery. We have lived through, as I suggested, a slave rebellion. We cannot pick up guns because they got the guns. You know, we cannot hit those streets again because they're waiting for us. Hmm? We have to do something else. Before each slave rebellion, there was something which I now call non-cooperation. How to execute this in detail is something each one of us have to figure out. But we could begin with the schools and take our children out of those schools. Take them off those buses. Everybody knows who thinks about it that you can't change a school without changing the neighborhood, and you can't change the neighborhood without changing the city. Ain't nobody prepared to change the city because they want the city to be white. All the American cities have begun to crumble when the white people moved out to get away from the niggers. Every crisis in every city is caused by that. 
How can you expect the people who cannot educate their own children to educate anybody else? This will be, well, contested. <laughs> Nevertheless, one's got to start somewhere. And I'll use that as an example. There are other things I have in mind, but I'm not really a tactician. I'm a disturber of the peace. I want you to think about it. Because I know what can happen if you do think about it. One more thing. It is useful to bear in mind that this country, and indeed the West, has been living on a war economy since 1939. It is useful to bear in mind that we would be at war now if we could afford to be. Ain't no place left to go to war. All the colonies, though they still belong to Europe, are no longer where they were. Now it's a matter of getting the, the, uh, the resources of the country out of, Europe hand, out of European hands and African hands. And we are involved in that. The black people of this country are involved in that. If we, this country, could afford to raise an army and afford to go to war, it would do so. <coughs> this country cannot raise an army to set anywhere in the world which it can trust. So, <laughs> we hold the Trump. <laughs> when, you try to slaughter, when you try to slaughter our people and leave them with nothing to lose, you create us about even nothing to lose. And if I ain't got nothing to lose, what are you going to do to me? <laughs> we have one thing to lose. That's our children. And we've never done that yet. After all, we haven't done that yet. And there's no reason for us to do it now. We hold the trunk, I said, right? Patience and shuffle the cards. Thanks.